going to start with a poem called The Death of a Fridge. It has one note, which is don't try this at home. It works, but don't try it at home. The Death of a Fridge. Poured on skin, lighter fluid burns shallow. My hand in flames was no worse than the plaster ripped off. We were more burnt by the sun. I can't even remember his name. He had a newspaper rolled in a torch, burning up too quick, and nowhere to drop it, so we slammed it in the fridge. The box sealed, the rubber trim sucked tight. I couldn't force it any more than I could pull apart a dinner plate. Not crack a dish, but hold the rims and pull it in two. Everything has its own way to break. The air was eaten, a dimple in the cool enamel, a crease, then, drawn from the inside, the whole white weight crumpled with thunks of deep struck metal as a girl trapped by an earthquake might smash keys on a pipe when she still thinks of rescue. I'm going to read a poem called Scuts, and if you don't know, a scut is the fluffy white tail on the back of a rabbit or a deer. And I think it's a fascinating evolutionary trait, because it's one of the advantages which doesn't advantage the individual. The rabbit doesn't benefit from having a great big white farm, but all the other rabbits benefit, because when it sees the fox and it runs, they see it running off and they themselves are warned. Guts. The rabbit's downy tail marks them as one of nature's grass digesters, the ones who hang sagnet from foxes' jaws that wallop when attempting speed, the ones whose side-faced eyes are trying to see both sides of the horizon, that plug away inches from the earth and never thought to lick warm blood. Animals the colour of the underbrush whose white butts flash in moist distress, strobe lights as they start to run, saying, I'm here, dinner, seeming stupid, till the patches of the hill you never saw were breathing move as one, unravelling the ground ahead in a white capped rush. This poem is called Telephone Girls. Girls have always been joined to telephone systems. Not just teenage gossips or 1940s girls in well fat lipsticks, scalps smelling of chemical burns for days after each perm. Girls plugged into circuit boards, primed for scandal, heavy baker light ear combs and mouthpieces rising like snake heads up from their breasts. That's not what I mean. I mean anchorites. Telephones to God. They chose to be built into church walls. Dame Julian of Norwich, Emma of All Saints, North Street, York. The masonry rising like a slow upward guillotine. The engineers would leave a slot to emit a parcel of light and air, food and requested prayers. But they believed that in this pure removal they had become a prayer machine. That each day of their silence would be another stitch, sewing their lips and ears into the robes of God until their tears would fall directly in his lap. I was trying to decide what poems to read when I was prepping my set last night and I saw that Boris Johnson might be coming back. <laughs> oh my god. So I decided to read a poem called Three King Canutes. Now, most of us, when we come across the King Canute myth, the first version we come across is usually the later one. So the one where King Canute is an idiot of a man who foolishly thinks that if he tells the waves to stop rising that they will. And then when we get older, we might come across the older version of King Canute, the original version, which is of a God-fearing king who wanted to demonstrate to the court that he was a mere mortal and that we should worship God. 
This book, poem is called Three Kinkinooks because it's got both of those plus one I have added. Three King Canoes. The king, his gold retainers, a school of priests, the men who can't remove their helmets out of doors, and the plush unarmoured across a mirror surface beach. One. Laugh. Laugh at the foolish fop haired wallow square face as he waves his sword, slashes water, cold stud, face infection hot with tears, a mug in ruined boots. Two. The second king has quietness, a loved teacher waiting for his class to own their error. Surf nuzzles at his ankles. The man's immovable except a roll of hair caught in the wind's chill currents and his eyes resting in the eye of each advisor until the sycophant wilts. Three. This last canute has brought a camera crew. His open suit and tie flap. His one concession, his women swapping heels for ballet pumps. When water fills his shoes, it doesn't matter. He is rich, and there are blankets in the waiting SUV. He roars the way to a halt as water is licking up his trouser legs. He thinks he's in the story, and a better story wins, but truth is just the story that the audience lets in. It doesn't matter if he's Canute or Canute. If we're in Norfolk or in Neverwhere, he's mic'd up, entertaining, and his wives and daughters' hair is sprayed as hard as bronze. The wind, the sea, cannot mar the shot. I did a workshop at the start of this year with um, Claire Shaw, and they mentioned that they collect poems about zombies. So I thought I should read my zombie poems since I'm reading alongside her. So, zombies. We thought there'd be flesh robots with thousand odd arms, relentless. But when they rose, they were so tired, just wanted to rest up, wet wood against a wall, dummies from a dump museum. They were excellent listeners. There were plans to pair them with the lonely and the elderly, designated benches for them to chat. But what little of them they had ran down. We forgot about the cremated, to be as light as dust. A single fleck of soil nudged, then another miles away. It took time, but sped up around the iron filing stage. Then the swarm, each individual a brown cloud. No body, no brain, no deadweight arms, no suitcase of meat. Ever been in a sandstorm? Feels like they've bitten at first, then burned. They blew right through us. We've only got two more. I'm going to read a poem called Explanation for Those Who Don't Know Love. And it's my mum I poem because people either love it or they hate me. They don't hate the poem, <laughs> they hate me, even though it's very clear that I am not the eye of this poem. Explanation for those who don't know love. I have a child and am more important than childless people. I am two people and have an extra vote. You cannot comprehend our bond. It is mysterious and I am greater because of it. So, in a tie-break situation, I am three people. My daughter is five and very bright for her age. This requires special consideration. <laughs> she is a delight and centers every conversation like a fantastic table decoration. <laughs> if she breaks your possessions, it's an interrogation of their meaning. <laughs> a state of blissful questioning which you have lost. <laughs> she cries. It's only because she wants something. She can't yet comprehend the magnitude of grief. So it's not selfish like when you cry. 
I'm going to end on a poem called How to Balance Law Books on Your Head. And it's about how to balance law books on your head. The problem isn't how. I absolutely know the answer is to go to Main Street, some town I don't live, and find a stranger who hates me. And my clothes, and my voice, and who, while she would never dream of hurting me in person, suspects the world would be better with me dead. And persuade her that she wants to stand so close, my greasy nose presses into hers and, recycling each other's soupy breaths, balance the books between us on our foreheads. My only problem is how to do that. Thank you.